Dr. Mel, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Mel's Message. Today, for the second time, I have a fabulous author by the name of John Brewer. Now, John, he's written probably more than 14 books, an amazing imagination, and a story worth telling. So today, we're going to not only talk with him, but we're going to talk about his book called A Mind Release. Welcome, John. How are you? Um, I can hear a little better now. Uh, they uh, took some debris out of one ear, but uh, I'm going to have to get this a hearing aid. I, I really am. Well, you know what? I will talk a little louder, and if I need to repeat something, just let me know. And of course, your beautiful wife, Mary Sue, is with us, so she can also can help with that. So to begin, John, tell me a little bit about your book, A Mind Release. Okay, it's basically at one level about family. Um, an 11-year-old boy is uh, abandoned by his father after his mother and sister die. And uh, he has no place to go, no one to uh, live with, so he gathers his uh, belongings and starts wandering, looking for a place where he can find work. This is in uh, Regency, England. And uh, if he didn't find a place to work, he could very well starve to death. <clears throat> and eventually after wandering, some minor adventures uh, occurring, he meets, we have a cat here who wants to join us. Most cats do, believe it or not. Uh, he he uh, finds himself uh, uh, near a potter's, well, a blacksmith shop. The fellow's name is Potter. And he's looking for his uh, apprentice who has uh, taken a leave of absence as he was likely to do. So George Wycombe, that's the boy's name, uh, gets taken in and uh, starts pumping the forge, which is rough, exhausting work, but he keeps at it. All right, let's take a few minutes and let's switch over for just a little bit and let's look at the cover reveal trailer. All right, now that we've seen the cover reveal, how did you come up with this story, John? Uh, I'm not sure. Sometimes I remember uh, something I see, something usually on television, something I read, something I someone tells me, and this kernel, this nucleus, this seed begins to sprout. But in this case, I did not. And uh, I, I cannot remember where I got it from, but uh, as I said, it's basically about family. So he joins the Potter family, which is the blacksmith, his wife and his daughter uh, becomes, as uh, apprentices uh, did in those days, part of the family. Uh, turns out the daughter is, um, was born uh, with, well, what I described basically as cleft palate syndrome. She's disfigured. And the other children mock her and, and make her life miserable. So uh, her habit has been, she never has learned to talk, uh, partly because uh, the other children uh, really wouldn't communicate with her. So her habit is to uh, get something to eat and run off in the woods and hide there until it's time to eat. 
And uh, perhaps because George wants to be part of the family and he feels sorry for her, he uh, begins to teach her how to read and write. Wow. That's the, uh, the board. Yeah. Well, that explains why a, there is a chalkboard on the name of this book, for sure. Yes. And it says, my name is Alice Potter. And he teaches her how to read and write. He also has uh, copies of the book uh, his father gave to his mother before she died and he left. Uh, Ivanhoe by Walter Scott. Right, let me ask you this. And he teaches it's her how to read from this. All right, let me ask you this, John. Is this book set in modern day times? In the past? Regency England. Uh, I know. In 1820s. There you go, in the 1820s. All right. It's a Regency romance. Okay. But um, not like any Regency romance you've ever heard of or read or, or seen, I assure you. How so? Hmm? How so? Well, uh, <laughs> As I said, the Regency romance usually involves a young woman who uh, wins the heart of some nobleman. Ah. And they marry. Okay. Uh, but now we have with a someone girl with girl who was yeah. disfigured, and it's a blacksmith's shop. And uh, there's no nobleman. Well, there is sort of. It turns out they, they grow close, they become friends. And uh, then she tells him about something she saw. Uh, she saw a man kill another man. Oh, no. And uh, George, who uh, had happened to uh, go through that area, had learned many years ago that uh, the man who... Uh, did the killing was the grandson of the man who owned the uh, uh, quarry and the big house and so forth. Uh, apparently wanted to take over the place, but unfortunately the killer saw her. And of course, her face was quite distinctive. She runs away. He chases her, but she's fast. But uh, she's worried they're in a different uh, shire, really. And uh, it wouldn't be easy for him to find her, uh, but she's worried. And she has good reason to be. Wow. This is more than just a tale about a family, then. I mean, this has uh, intrigue in it and mystery in it yes. and thriller in it. Yes. Okay. Wow. Uh, let me, uh, this question, John, is actually going to go to, to your beautiful wife, Mary Sue. Is he like this all the time with his imagination? Hey. <laughs> I'm just asking. I, I really want to know this. <laughs> um, he confines it to paper. <laughs> So the answer to that question is definitely. He's like this all the time. His imagination just flows, huh? Well. Don't be shy now, John. <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, the, then uh, the story, uh, uh, he's learning the trade as a blacksmith's apprentice. Very hard work. And this... Uh, former apprentice who was basically fired because he never showed up uh, comes into the picture and uh, he uh, the George the hero and Alice the heroine she's actually the center of the story uh, decide to get married this is in part to I well, he's partly in love with her, and he he's partly wants to protect her. Okay. And a good thing, too, because the uh, ex-apprentice tries to rape her just before the wedding. And George comes out and gives the guy a beating and uh, kicks his 
he has his pants down and he throw, kicks him out into the street where a crowd has gathered to watch. And the guy disappears. He leaves town. Okay, fine. Yeah, and but Mary, that doesn't sound like fine. Yeah, it's me. That sounds like there's something about to happen. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to wait. <laughs> anyway, something does happen. Yeah. Uh, George is uh, working in the blacksmith shop. The uh, We have here. Yeah, it's not on screen. Don't worry about oh, it. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. The pink nose kitty cat. Okay. The gray with blue eyes. Anyway, um, everything seems fine. George is working and he hears uh, his wife, Alice, scream and he comes out and there's this guy with a big knife. He's trying, he slashed her wrist. She's trying to defend herself. He's trying to kill her. And George uh, lets the guy have it with his hammer, and the guy drops his knife and runs off to a chariot. And he can see in the chariot the former blacksmith's apprentice. And he can see when the assassin, would be assassin, gets in, there's a cue on the uh, chariot. A uh, carriage. Well, it's... It's a carriage. Well, it was called a chariot, but anyway. Uh, and the Q stands for Query View, which was this name of the uh, mansion that the uh, original owner had built from the profits from the quarry and his farm and so forth before he was murdered by his grandson. Okay. That means uh, the secrets of her location is out. Uh, the uh, murderer knows where she is and he's uh, probably gonna try again, but for a while nothing happens until um, a troop of gypsies arrives. They camp nearby. Um, you don't have to tell the whole story. Okay, well, anyway, uh, <laughs> George and Wallace decide to visit the place because, you know, this is interesting. And they're kidnapped. Wow. I mean, this, okay. And they wind up in the cellar, oh, the wine wait. cellar of the mansion oh. with the uh, killer. Oh. And uh, his two accomplices, including the former apprentice. And uh, the guy tells them, the apprentices the, and the uh, assassin, to go dig their graves. Then wow. they leave them locked in the cellar. Okay, well, that's getting close to the end, and I'll right. stop. Right, so we, yeah. Well, I was going to say, we don't want to give it all away. Um, this, this book intrigues me in a lot of different ways. First, I love the aspect that you've managed to combine romance with a thriller and action all at once. And that should appeal to both men and women. So job well done. But another thing, you very rarely see a main character in a book that has such a disfigurement or a deformity where somebody comes to the rescue. And in this particular case, we're talking about Alice. And so that right there, it, it just intrigues me on the get-go because it's not something most writers write about. Although it makes for a fabulous, you know, antagonist or protagonist in this case, uh, which she is. So do you see this particular book as a sequel, possibly? Did I? I'm sorry? Do you see this book as a possible sequel? Um, no. Uh, I've only written one sequel to one of my books. Okay. Uh, all the others are sui generis, I think is the expression. Um, 
Oh, one of my previous books uh, called Quadrille uh, involves a female character. My female characters, by the way, are human beings. They aren't just bit dolls. Uh, they have personalities. Anyway, uh, the lead female character in this uh, was born with a club foot. And uh, the lead male character meets her. I'm being molested by a kitty cat. Uh, they're, they're both students at the University of London. And basically, uh, they become buddies, although she has deeper feelings for him. Uh, and then the First World War, War breaks out and so forth. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the only other uh, case I've had so far, I've written so far of a With woman, she, about she's forward. plain and uh, you know, a club foot, she's crippled, uh, but she has a personality. Well, uh, apparently most of your characters do because that's, it, and like I said, I've been in a account and you have being, a fertile imagination and there's the baby. <laughs> I love it. Now, for those of you that may yeah. be joining us, I am speaking with John Brewer about his book, actually his 14th book called A Mind Release. And for those that just jumped in on there, you and his cat and his beautiful wife. So we, we've got them all here with us today. John, with this particular book, A Mind Release, is there maybe a moral to this that you wish to get across to other people? Well, there is. It's on the last page. Well, they don't uh, give it away. They'll have to read it to find uh, out. I, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want you to do it either. It. Yeah, it's I don't the want... development. It's the part of the I development. Think people will like. Well, that's what I mean. Now they're going to go. Now I have to read the book because neither one of us are talking about it. And sometimes it's the things that we don't say that will get people interested in your book. So well done there. With all of that said, I do want to thank Strat Advertising for bringing you back to me today for your second interview. And I look forward to a lot more. And I hope we take the time and go over your each of your books one at a time because you have such an amazing fertile imagination and I, I am glad that you're writing and I am happy that you are presenting such enormous characters to a whole world so thank you for that 